Hello, okay, Bob. Ben. Hello, Bob in Maui. Yes, Ben in Summerstown, That's London. That's right. I'm in. Uh, okay, Ben. Um, on one level, I think that humanity, the, the consciousness of humanity in a way, uh, whatever it is, the private subtle consciousness that we can't know and each one of us doesn't change. But what changes is language. And I include in the definition of language all the artifacts and technologies we create. I so expect that you to, Bob. The, I expect you to include all that. But I have to take you up on your very first point, the private citadel. This is an idea of the unfathomable dark recesses of interiority that I don't believe in. I don't find it so tragic. I don't find this black hole at the center of myself that people say they find in Lessing, that they find in the German Romantics, that Slavoj Zizek finds, that Lacan finds. I don't find it. Do you really? No. What I was thinking of was when you said to me the other day that we can't tell what Iris means when she says things or what she's taking in and you said isn't that with everybody that that part of the selves that we don't know well I'm, you know what I mean? yeah yeah absolutely I mean I'm, I'm keen on the idea that our syntactical expressions don't exhaust the thing conceived otherwise there'd be no point in carrying on I want an imbalance and a fact that it's unknown um, because that gives me exuberance and gives me a reason to communicate so, I, but I don't find it like a, uh, the way you express yourself was strange, a citadel. It sounded rather like Wyndham Lewis to me, you know, the, the consciousness as a citadel defending itself against everybody else. Yeah, no, that, I was actually quoting McLuhan, so it probably did come from Lewis in some way. Yeah. Um, he talked about the, how mass media or media don't affect the uh, citadel of consciousness, and I, I added private. Mm. But um, I was just saying that there might be a part of humanity think, that doesn't change. I think change. they affect it completely. I think we are products of social being, that we are symptoms and expressions of social being. And it doesn't worry, that doesn't worry me at all. I don't think I'm losing anything by saying it. I think I'm gaining something. The, this idea of uh, an unfathomable depth, which is somehow untouched by the times, doesn't appeal to me. You know, okay. It's not, okay, I get, I get that, and yeah. I'm, and I, I, I would, I agree to this extent yeah. that yeah. the, uh, that part that I was citing, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, part that can't change, whatever it is, uh, that's not even relevant to the discussion. So I would go to this, the point I was making, okay. since we can't know the citadel, whether it is or isn't. So uh, I'm, ta it. I'm talking about language, it. and I'm including all artifacts. So that's what I think when we talk about revolution or change transformation uh, or resistance it's in the realm of language and language may include everything that we think we know okay well I, that, that, I, mean, I think language can alter and it can hack anything it wants I don't think there's a principle of non-language I think there's a language as a spiral amoeba able to encroach itself anywhere it likes and can change itself and learn and develop itself so I don't um, I'm just arguing against an unfathomable chasm between some kind of reality we can't touch because as you say we can't touch it so let's forget that <laughs> yeah I'm willing I was just saying that that may be there and it may be a factor but we can't know it it seems so I just want to say it and then drop it because so I'm so I'm talking about language and, and I'm talking about how language permeates media and media permeates language and they're both the same meaning media and language so I'm saying the same thing you just said mm, mm, mm. Sorry, okay so I, I, then I, I, I do realize that right at the beginning of these discussions these weekly discussions we're going to have I've interrupted you at the very first point and Bob, I'm dying to hear the rest of it, so I'm going to try and keep quiet and just listen to you, okay? So, no, no, so, you so can... I want you to you know, develop I, this argument you have about what we can do with language and revolution and so on, because that's what really interests me. Right, and that's what I'm interested in. And um, I don't mind you interrupting, because, you know, I've done talk shows for years, and you're always interrupted in talk shows. As a matter of fact, it's rare you get to finish your, your point. So uh, it's good to have the opportunity here. So with that in mind, I'm looking at us, Supposedly, it's Marx and McLuhan go head to head. And the figure I want to 
present, uh, I guess the punching bag in the middle of Marx and McLuhan is Zappa. All right? So I was rereading uh, Heavens his... be praised that I found somebody who'll take Frank Zappa seriously. Sorry, carry on. What did you say? You have a phrase? Heavens be praised that I found someone else who'll take Frank Zappa seriously in a philosophical discussion. So oh, yeah. And, uh, Zappa me. raises... Oh, he's the, the most appropriate... Zappa is somewhere between uh, Marx and McLuhan or maybe somewhere else, but he's definitely the most relevant guy mm. recently in arguing about what's happening. Mm. Uh, what gave me and, confidence that we're on the right trail was when Michael H. Tenser, um, a young poet and critic uh, living in New Zealand at the moment, met Eugene Chabon. He um, unloaded to him uh, a recent set of discussions we'd had about McLuhan and, and, and Marx. And immediately Eugene Chabon said, um, that's exactly where his head's at. And I consider Eugene Chabon to be the, the best extension of the Frank Zappa attitude. And you know, felt really uh, encouraged you know, that, that, that um, someone of that caliber is also thinking on these lines. Yes, and, and he's a member of the Church of the Subgenius, so he's working for me indirectly. <laughs> Pretty indirectly there. <laughs> what did you say? Pretty indirectly. Yes. But, <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, so I was rereading and preparing for our talks um, Frank Zappa's article uh, for Life magazine in June 1968 calls, called the, Oral, the Oracle Has It All Psyched Out. Mm. Okay. And he has this great quote. He says, can prolonged exposure to mixed media produce mutations? It's a question that he's raising in the article. Mm. Well, this is where Have I you, go, yes, 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 and yes. Don't you? Yeah, yes to what? That long-term exposure to mixed media produces mutations. Right. Now, have you read this article when you oh, did your I'm research, really or is it in your mind? It's, it's one of the great um, statements, isn't it? That, along with the statement about pinheads that, that, that Zappa made, uh, the press release for 200 motels. They're, they're, Zappa was attempting to be coherent. It's quite rare. And <laughs> okay, so, so you're saying that the article is a great statement. Yeah, and, and, and that's a great... I mean, you made me think about it again, because... It's saying, you see, I find it uh, relates to a, um, a proper dialectical view of physics, of what the world, what the universe actually consists of. Um, that in saying that um, mutation is produced by the mixed media we're in, understands how life itself and DNA and all the rest of it was actually produced. That, that understanding that mixing is what what substances are doing all the time and that to be part of that mutation is not bad. I mean one of Frank's and Captain Beefheart's big things is that to adapt or adapter is not wrong. That to change and friends don't mind just how you grow and that whole basic politics of, of um, of, of personal politics of beef art and zapper at the beginning I think permeates all their work and is something I've really learned from yeah I agree and so um, can prolonged exposure to the mixed media produce mutations he asked that question earlier in the article and then he goes through the history of uh, rock and roll R&B and then he projects a recent conversation he had with Herbie Cohen uh, where they discuss the power of sound and mm. vibrations and frequencies mm. on matter, plants, humans. Mm. And Zappa speculates about what we could do with sound and maybe even nefarious ent entities, what they would do with it. Now, this article prepares the ground and flows right into uh, the story on the booklet for Uncle Meat. And then it goes on and and is flipped. The theme in uh, the Uncle Me booklet is flipped in Joe's Garage. <coughs> so I want to, that's my trajectory there, my arc. It's an amazing, this is the conceptual continuity. Zappa exploring 
the potential of electrified sound or non-electrified sound, amplified digital sound, and the effects on people and masses and individuals and taste and fashion. And he's doing this as a, quote, scientist. Mm. Well, and the thing is that Zappa is so important in looking at how media works because he was tracing the real connections and effects. Because if you quote that in isolation, that electronics and vibrations can affect you, you can get into a... You end up with Genesis P. Origins, Robin Gristle, and kind of mystical ideas of... And also kind of just amusing ideas that, you know, you produce a tone that makes everybody vomit. And this is really important. And did you know they can use sound as a weapon? Do you know those kind of um, really radical ideas about music? And if you think about it, Frank Zappa always avoided that area of direct affect because he's too aware of how all these things are being used for everybody in their little lonely teenage bedrooms. He's always aware of the sexual nature of the um, tomfoolery going on in popular culture. And he's always asserting those. And this sort of primal idea of sound affecting you and changing you is something that really he, he mocks. Don't you That's think? right. Even though that um, quote on its own, without my gloss just then, could seem to go there. You know, that... <coughs> that, that that music can have a direct effect on you. And of course, music does have a direct effect on you, and I'm not denying that. But the idea that we could support a music that if we just broadcast totally, um, we can change everything because um, it, it's kind of like it's a weapon um, is not what Frank meant. Yeah, the he did say my guitar wants to kill you, <laughs> but the... It wants um, to kill your mama, actually, not you. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. Wants to kill your mama. Uh, okay, so I'm going to read a quote here, the end of the article. But in response to what you're just saying, I'll use the word tactile, and tactile means ambivalence. Uh, tactile means not a sense, but the interplay of senses. So it's not any particular spot. And we moved into a very tactile world, and I think Zappa was the, uh, the uh, best uh, exploiter, appropriator, and understander of tactility as a uh, musical Bob, phenomenon. Bob, I mean, Bob, Bob, from your McLuhan esque background, tactility is one of your huge concepts, and I just want to ask you a question about it here. As you say that this system we're in is producing more and more tactility, but here we are, you're in Maui, I'm in Somerstown, and we're having a conversation. A lot of people would say, but there's no tactility in that. That, that we're, we're really apart, we're in cyberspace, we're untactile, we're, we're not material, we're etherized, electronic, voices, and so on. So, how do you apply to that? How, how come yeah. this system is getting more tactile, and so we're, <laughs> we're getting less tactile? Uh, okay. Uh, I'm using McCool's definition, I think it was a major insight uh, that he came up with that um, he got from uh, Joyce, maybe Lewis, and what he, did, what he meant by tactility is not the contact of the finger touching the table or any no. kinetic pressure. Really? It's, when, really? it's when you let go and then touch again, what he called the gap or the interval, the rhythm, the tapping of the fingers is the tactility, the expressive tactility. It's the letting go and then a retouch and then letting go. If we couldn't let go, then we wouldn't have tactility. And so most Westerners think tactility is physical contact, but that's the kinetic sense, according to McLuhan. So we are extremely tactile here. We're interfacing each other in this uh, strange membrane, which you can't touch, but it resonates. I don't even know if that's the right word. We're inside each other. That's tactility. Well, Bob, it's, 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 it's quite extraordinary because one reason I wanted to talk to you on a Wednesday night is I've just done my radio program, so I'm kind of in that mode. And yeah. one of the things I was talking about just this afternoon was about, well, it's gone, um, tactility. You have to remind me what we're talking about. Uh, that is not kinetic pressure. It's the interval. Yeah, was I was trying to um, think about why I so like how George Clinton uses electronics 
and why I like the way Sun Ra uses electronics and I don't like the way a lot of people use electronics in music. And I was talking about the finger on the button and the way that they make you aware that the finger on the button can create an automatic rhythm through touching it and then they let it go and then they put their finger back on it. And you have this strange trembling feeling of excitement that they can unleash this huge power that they haven't produced you know it's electricity all this huge sort of rhythmic um intoxicating thing but then they can turn it off with a switch and it's exact i was saying this afternoon exactly what you're saying i think which is that it's taking your finger off the button which is tactility not keeping your finger on the button excellent <laughs> that- <laughs> I mean, there's the, there's the synchronicity uh, you, you're preparing for today's tonight's talk uh, yeah. on your show. Yeah, cool. Okay, so if we agree, if and, and like Zappa's emphasis on hand signals in his conducting is such a great expression of tactility because he could flash. It's like ESP. You flash and then you respond and then it comes back. It's rapidity. The electric world is so speeded up. It's so fast, so instant that the only way you can uh, describe it sensorially is it's a tactile phenomenon. We're in touch, but people get confused if they think it's just the actual pressure and the contact. But, I mean, music... But, yeah, but there's something else about what Frank was doing when he was he raised a finger, which he, he returned to some of the most primal, direct things, like raising a finger with a whole... I mean, he's got all these fantastic trained musicians. They've all got this amazing equipment. We're all so mediated. And he's making everything come back to like he's holding up one finger which is sort of what you know a dad can do with a baby you know, wave your finger in the air and the baby opens the mouth and you put the finger in the mouth and that's very nice and you play a game and you know so we have all these mediations but in a way i think that, that frank was like um showing that you that by putting in the most direct and about speed you're saying electronics is fast there's no electronics which is as fast as us seeing what somebody does you know, those photons are faster than electricity. And in the same way, a mouth noise is faster than any kind of laptop um, noise that anyone can produce. I mean, if you've seen free improvisation, you know that people with laptops are laboring. And, you know, they're trying to find this file and that file. And they're so slow. And then somebody going... is faster. Right, but... If you're not on the radio, not many people hear it, but if you're on the radio, everybody hears the most. So the radio carries the most sound, you know, yeah. in, a, in a broader yeah, level. Um, is um, essential radio equipment. Yes, okay. Now, you just cited the uh, Frank using one gesture and controlling his musicians. Yeah. That's in yeah. the famous uh, pinhead quote, you know, that section from the conceptual continuity. Where in the pile, in the mountain of pins, you imagine there's a something, a place, and he says a little wink or a gesture is made. Yeah, even so in secret is. when no one can see it. Yeah. but yes, ESP might pick it up, or the electric. Like when he's in the studio, it's not about the ra- ESP. The fact that you did it meant that you did it, and you remember it. I mean, this is a defense of subjective real experience i mean you know just because everybody ignores what you do it doesn't mean it doesn't matter i mean for me that's frank's whole polemic i mean he's defending the the losers at high school who are made to feel that what they do doesn't matter because they haven't got the big shiny car and the the girl with the blonde hair and all the rest of that crap that high school puts on you and he's saying no even if you're staring at a crumpled a bit of rubbish on the side of the road and you're miserable well, that's actually your experience. So he's defending that experience that people have. Yes, let me respond to that and then say something else. Yes, uh, wasn't it uh, Potato Head Bobby and his girlfriend had a his wife had a diamond ring, a little plastic ring they didn't care about, remember? Yeah. Didn't mean a thing. Now, Bob, tell me, we're just initiating these discussions. Do you do a, sometimes when I, I go off on, you know, I because um, I'm very aware with this particular technology we're using, which is Skype, that when I'm talking, I can't hear you. When you're talking, you can't hear me. It's quite odd. Um, but I, I feel sometimes I, I, I express myself and I get a bit excited and then I wait for your answer and you go, yes. And then it's like, I go, oh dear. I said that, you know, you're kind of going, um, mm, let's put that aside and get back to, so are we getting on? 
Yes, no, everything's great. Uh, I just, you, you, as you say things, I get things I want to say immediately, but I can't say them immediately. I have to wait till you finish. And and I want to go back to before I forget it. You were saying um, that the the guy in the in the mountain of pins uh, makes a gesture it can't be seen, but there could be, let's include the joke that you can't see Zappa when he's interviewed on the radio. You can hear him, but you can't see him. So he might be making communications to the DJ that's interviewing him. Let's think of uh, the medium environments too as ways to look at. Uh, what Frank is referring to. So I'm just saying a, a gesture can be heard, but it can be invisible. So I always think of the uh, media environments that could be implied rather than the, the philosophical principle that uh, he's supporting subjective knowledge or something, or the, the primacy of personal subjectivity. You know what I mean? I include that, that, what you're I saying, do. but I want to bring I, another I point. I know what you mean, and I agree with what you mean, because... Um, Michael Tenser made a point, I'm thinking about him a lot recently, made a point exactly like that, just quite recently when he was, and I've forgotten that again, it doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> it'll come back, I was just, it'll it, come was back. It, it comes around. Um, yeah, what, was it about the, what I was just saying about the guy invisible in the studio, does that trigger off anything? It's, um... Ah. Okay, I'll go on. I want to read this quote, because this is the question... Uh, that Zappa asked, and remember, in uh, in uh, Cletus Aridus Aritus, it's the questions mm. who are killed. Mm. And uh, remember, he tells me, uh, well, in the Bob Marshall interview with Zappa, he says that eat that Christ question was originally <laughs> eat that Christian. So Christian questions are inter interchangeable here. So here's what he says. Ben, if you were drunk and it was the middle of summer, Saturday night about 11.30, and you had your comfortable clothes on and you were in a small beer joint dancing and it's crowded, temperature about 82 degrees, and the local rock and roll combo, Ruben and the Jets, is playing Green Onions or something that sounds just like it, all full of parallel fifths moving monotonously through a root progression 1, 2B, 4, 3B, or something like that over and over again. And the guitar player goes to take a solo and stomps his fuzz tone into action and turns his amplifier all the way up so his guitar squeals and screams and sounds absolutely vicious. And he bends and mangles the strings and starts to really get it on, gyrating and going totally berserk and playing his ass off and everything. If you were drunk, Ben, and all this was going on and you were out there dancing and sweating and really feeling the music, every muscle and fiber of your being, etc., etc., and the music suddenly get louder and more vicious, louder and viciouser, than you could ever imagine. And you danced harder and got sweaty and feverish and got your unsuspecting self worked up into a total frenzy, bordering on electric Buddha and Nirvana, total acid freak cosmic integration, one with the universe. And you were drunk and hot and not really in control of your body or your senses. You were possessed by the music. And all of a sudden the music gets even louder. And not only that, it gets faster and you can't breathe. But you can't stop either, it's impossible to stop. And you know you can't black out because it feels too good. I ask you now, if you were drunk and all this stuff is happening, Ben, all over the place and somebody with the best intentions in the world made you stop so he could ask you this question, quote, is a force this powerful to be overlooked by a society that needs all the friends it can get, unquote, would you listen, Ben? I'd listen. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd still get it on, you know. Or is <laughs> I mean, You'd Bob, be able to stop dancing. Well, Bob, we 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 you introduced this. I mean, um, this idea to me earlier when you said to me that you thought that Frank Zappa was therapy for getting away from the intoxication of black music, and that shocked me. That shocked me <laughs> to think about it that way, because in some ways. The whole of Frank Zappa's work has been my way into black music. I mean, he introduced me to Eric Dolphy, he introduced me to Howlin' Wolf, he told me about huge areas of, of music I'd never thought of listening to before. But I agree with you that there's something double-edged and critical and awakening in Zappa, which doesn't allow you simply to um, want to just go on with the funk, you know? Exactly, and I did hear you comment on that thought that I had made to you, well, three months ago on your show. You made a passing remark saying that Bob Dobbs says that, um, you know, Zappa was uh, satirizing black music or our addiction or our love of, of 
black music and then you qualified it. You said something like, well, it's not that black and white. Do you remember <laughs> saying that idea? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's yeah, and, and I agreed with what you said. It's not, it's tactile, it's ambivalent what Frank's doing, but he's certainly not going to exclude the detachment or the awareness level that he is advocating because... Well, um, no, Frank is not the average white band, is he? No, no. Frank, Frank is, is on a mission. He's on duty, as he said to Fritz, the yeah. German customs yeah. guy or whatever. Yeah. Remember that story? Yeah, yeah. He's on yeah, duty. Yeah. yeah, when he's go when he's going through customs and and uh, in Germany, and he uh, uh, the the guy is assuming all the mothers on drugs, and he says, "What are you on, Frank?" And Frank said, "I'm on duty," which was a great uh, response. Yeah. So I'm thinking of that. Yeah. Okay, so I want to just uh, so you um, the black thing. I immediately I think of in. Uh, 1970-71, he writes um, an article, Hit Parader, and he, and he puts down, he says, all the blues guitarists are running around worshipping B.B. King. And that said after other articles earlier in the late 60s where he's praising at least early B.B. King. And then I saw him on a TV interview in Canada in uh, May 1979. He was on one of the main talk shows. And Peaches and Herb, maybe that's who they were, some black couple, uh, were on with them. And they were talking. And eventually they got pissed at Frank because he was not going along with the shared assumptions of uh, how great uh, their music was or something. You know what I mean? And it really struck me that, that he, he was not fooled by anybody's music, no matter how great its history had been or whatever it had done for him. He lived in the present, and he knew that music required something new, oh. something different. And therefore, he's always commenting. I mean, you know, I went through a lot of these articles preparing for this. He's always making fun of the uh, excessive uh, playing of uh, sacred blues numbers on the radio and, and how he's not getting played. Do, do you follow what I'm saying? There, there is a criticism in there, a critique. Well, I would like to translate what you've just said into my Marxist language and say that, that as a as a living, um, I wouldn't say quivet, but it's a word that doesn't exist, but as a, as a living, querulous, clear and jelly-like in his intensity and electricity artist, Frank Zappa is really aware of commodification and what it does and how it um, clamps down on what you want to do. So he's aware that, I mean, he, he's supporting what, he learned from black music and he loves it and he, he wants to extend it and he can see these creeps and morons who want to contain it and sell it and know what it is and package it and write about it and it, it, it's horrific and his response is, I mean we had this in England in a minor um, controversy which came across about was Frank Zappa jazz and Charles Shaw Murray forgot all his countercultural credentials and tried to pretend that Frank Zappa was jazz on Radio 3 and deliberately played the jazz tracks, you know, the sort of acceptable tracks and chopped off anything where a swear word or anything interruptive could happen. And so we had to think about what was Frank Zappa's relationship to jazz. And of course you can pull out Frank Zappa saying really rude things about jazz. It's just a bunch of noodles. He didn't relate to bebop. He liked R&B. Um, and, and, and things where he seems anti-jazz and but my point was well you can pull out quotes from Duke Ellington and Miles Davis and these people the, the, well they're incredibly rude about jazz they can't stand being corralled in this stupid area which means music that black people do and they're saying well we're doing music you know what was this why am I always doing jazz every time I do music it's called jazz and it must be very frustrating if you're a a black composer, you know, everything you do is jazz, you know, you, know, you probably end up going crazy and becoming Anthony Braxton or something. Um, so, you know, the, the, the Frank's honesty on that and his commitment, you know, that his particular way of seeing things, his verres and do what kind of um, abstract way of seeing music is a really strong idea about music and it it's actually stronger than all these sort of games about race and who should be paid off and who's 
you know, these little kind of, you've got to doff the cap here, and it interrupts that. And that's great. That's why suddenly he's on PC and wrong. You know, he's not going, oh, you know, the way these, you know, on a talk show, we have some creepy moron going, oh, yeah, jazz, I love jazz, you know, I love Oscar Peterson, and you just want to kick him. Because <laughs> they don't know anything about music. You know, they're neither here nor there. Yes, and I would... I would go so far to say that Zappa was not, you can't align him with any particular genre of music. He wasn't even a musician. He was a scientist. Mm -hmm. And he was using the, the laboratory, the uh, MK Ultra conditioning that was going on, uh, the mass consumerhood of the consumer amoeba was his phrase. The yeah. consumer amoeba were being massaged. And he was interested in seeing if one could get into a different state of mind in relation to that, or Bob, a different state Bob, of, of beauty. That, Bob, you said the, 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 um, the consumer amoeba would be the massage. I, uh, you know, uh, I'm following you as a McLuhanite, and there's various puns in McLuhanism between message and massage. Yes. Uh, was that the pun you were making there? No, I was. Uh, you misheard me. I said the consumer amoeba were being massaged by right. the uh, okay. consumerist programming, the yeah. consumerist commodification. Yeah. Well, Bob, finally, that is where we stand, isn't it? I mean, this is why we want to do these talks: is that we believe in a, a wake up, a shock, um, a difference to be made in the way in which people consume media. Yes, and 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 I I'm proposing that. We're starting a revolution, but we have to figure out where the other guys or women who tried it before, where they went wrong, or what can be done, or is the revolution happening anyways? That's what I'm, that's the present mandate of our talks. We, if we're going to start something, create awareness, or even wonder if it can be done, we're just using Zappa, McLuhan, and Marx as this mm. jumping off point. Mm. And we're starting from, <clears throat> because it was, um, became clear to me reading uh, Boltansky on um, management theory that there are two sides of Marx which he kept together and there's the bohemian side of Marx which is the criticism of capitalism because it makes you feel bad and there's the sociological more objective side of Marx which is criticizing capitalism because it makes the world starve and those two sides, those two ways of looking at things are I think everybody's got both of them, but people in their specialities stress one or stress the other. And I feel the way we're going is we're going from the aesthetic side, that we're starting off from uh, how we're not starting from a socio-political analysis from the outside. We're saying we ourselves feel uncomfortable with most of the things which are allowed by most of the people around us to be nice culture or good culture. Or we're... We want to interrupt that. We don't agree. Is that how you feel? Yes, but I wouldn't limit myself to aesthetic. I, I'm, I'm tactile. I'll go over to the sociological, political. Yeah. Uh, also, go back and forth, oscillate, because they, they're starting to... I mean, uh, some writers say we have an aestheticized commodification. And they're, yeah. those are sociologists, yeah. sociologists saying that. So the boundaries... Um, uh, come up, uh, disappear in that, but I'm looking for a quote on my little inventory here. Uh, Zappa was commenting on the Fugs back in the late 60s, and he said that uh, they were too obsessed with socio-political areas, uh, trying to uh, say fuck on the air and all that, and yeah. think that was the revolution, and he uh, didn't, he thought they were, if I can find it, um, he thought they were uh, limited, and so maybe yeah, he was involved, emphasizing involved. the off, aesthetic. Get off what Frank said about the Fugs. Let's talk about what we think about the Fugs. I mean, how do you feel <laughs> listening to a Fugs LP? Well, when I first heard them in the 60s, uh, it uh, was crude. I should, I should inform any listeners that, of course, you are very old. Yeah, yeah, I'm 87 now. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, for your listeners, I met Frank Zappa in 1958. Uh, even though people like Simon don't believe me, that's true. I yeah, overheard well, them Simon in a nightclub. Prend if Simon Prentice doesn't believe you, then we don't want to pursue that path, Bob. <laughs> the, uh, Obviously, anyways, Simon Prentice I've been is around. I've been around a long Simon. time, yeah, yeah. and when I heard the Fugs, some college students played it for me. Mm. Um, we like boobs a lot, and a couple things were uh, cute, funny, but 
their music the musicianship was so puny compared to Frank. Well, this is the and, point I, want, I wanted to say, is that when Frank is saying um, they are sociopolitical, what is re the thing is that to lack musical quality is actually a sociopolitical failing. That these, all these realms interact and are true, and you can look at everything from the different points, but, you know, the point is that there isn't sort of good politics on one side and then you have to suffer bad art. If you're suffering bad art, there's something bad sociopolitically with the area you're in and with, with the people you're in and the event you're in. I don't believe in suffering bad art for politics or vice versa, you know, that, that we need to erupt, that the actual correctness that exists that we could have is both at once. And if you lose that, then you become a boring tosser. Yeah, and and so uh, I was always struck, and I mean, I was confronted with all kinds of uh, consumer choices, the Jefferson Airplane, Grateful Dead, and late 60s, and I just found that they never had the power of Zappa, and that's why I, uh, I wouldn't celebrate the Fugs. It was nice what they did, cute and that, but uh, yeah. I always thought that Zappa was addressing the issues. And well, I always thought well, that he was the, the yeah. rock musician closest to the McLuhan issues. Well, that's why we talk to each other, isn't it? That's our, our common ground, is that we agree on having our brains um, being convinced that Zappa is a touchstone for something. And <laughs> that makes us um, different from the postmodern um, you know, hordes of postmodernists who who don't have an anchor or a touchstone, who, who think all touchstones are like part of a residual male testicle bad way of thinking about things and holding something and having something and you should be fluid and you should change and you shouldn't. Whereas it seems to me that we can communicate with each other because we think in sticking our hands down into that horrible mucky sawdust brand tub dip of contemporary culture that when we found Zappa we found something hard and real and solid which is sort of using uh, Wyndham Lewis terminology about what is good visually and used to worry me a lot in the 70s when I used to think about it as it seemed very phallic um, but that we agree that that finding that thing and bumping into it and liking it matters and that you could use that as a way of looking at society and politics and everything else that you want to talk about so that's I mean I, I'm sort of floundering around trying to find the basis for the fact of uh, a, um, a theoretical way of explaining why I like talking to you and what we're going to do on these weekly discussions yeah you you remember when uh, Zappa when he was younger he would uh, invite people over and play his record collection but he plays Stravinsky or Verez to test them remember absolutely. that absolutely it was a when he played them for A's, it wasn't like, oh, I hope you like this, and he felt upset. It was an intelligence test. And that, that <laughs> when I heard that, it appealed to me so much. I just wished I'd lived like that more. That's right. And so I used, I replayed that by with Zappa. So I met a lot of postmodern thinkers or all kinds of intellectuals. Been doing it for 40 years. And eventually, if I'm talking to them, I will bring up Zappa. And that will determine uh, whether they fail or pass any in any further conversation with me. It's that simple. If you know, and most people had nothing to say about Zappa. They didn't know anything about him. And uh, that's as McLuhan used to say: you get ahead of the other guy by dealing with what he doesn't know. And Zappa was the uh, cipher for what they didn't know. <laughs> and it would fit very well as a McLuhanite. To, to use Zappa in that way because Zappa was so adept at all the different media and producing criticisms of them and being very knowing about that. I mean, in my life, uh, defining myself as a Marxist has been more difficult because, because of the political incorrectness of Zappa. So often when I've played Frank Zappa in Marxist circles, immediately just the comment is, it's sexist, it's this, it's that, you know, the, 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 you know, you know it's wrong. And... Uh, but, um, but and I would add that the other appeal of Zappa for me was he didn't take it seriously. That was what was tremendous. Some people, I've heard people say that, well, people like Zappa back in the 70s were snobs. They, they hooked up Zappa as some symbol of intelligence that they wanted to be identified with. No, it was Zappa's total manipulation anarchy 
and uh, the fact that he could even laugh at himself and everything he was doing as he was doing it. He, yeah, I don't believe there's much upwardly mobile um, cultural, uh, what do they call it, cultural capital or some awful uh, concatenation <laughs> of words that don't work together um, that Frank Zappa was, was playing because um, the, the furrow he, he plows uh, goes so deep that it turns up your own shit. Exactly. And um, I always liked a line he did in a... Uh, I'm pretty good at remembering uh, Zappa quotes and where they were. It was the L.A. Free Press, August 69. He said, people don't, uh, don't understand they can do something very seriously that you don't take serious. Well, you can do something you don't take serious and do it very seriously. Yeah. You, you, you ever seen that quote? No, I've never seen that quote, but it explains to me um, why... I can play George Clinton, and if I open the microphone and my three-year-old Iris plays a tambourine on it, it sounds fantastic. Whereas if I got the best musicians I know and the most intelligent poets I know, and we tried to overdub George Clinton seriously, it would sound horrible. You know, <laughs> there's, there's something about what the unknowing can do which produces information for the knowing, and the relationship between the knowing and unknowing is knowledge. And, that and that's tactility. That ah, oscillation. Ah, is that what you call it? Because tactility shifts, Bob. At one point I thought tactility was materialism. Is this tactility is everything that's good. Y yes. <laughs> well, it's, I have to ask you, what is the opposite of tactility? Um, getting stuck in one sense, either kinetic, visual, acoustic, osmic, specializing. Well, these are the people we call boring bureaucrats, I think. <laughs> that is not good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I know why we have to have bureaucracies, I understand it, um, mm. why we have it, but bure bureaucrats can't recognize when we can have other kinds of organizations. Uh, well, they they become we, stick in the minds. That's the that problem with them. Given that we're proposing this um, absolute revolution and, and, and disagreement with all separations, it's quite situationist what we're saying, um, how do you feel about the division of labor? Is there any possible division of labor in, in, in labor in utopia? Or are, are we all going to be mopping floors, you know, in, in the socialist utopia? Okay, well, I like the, the models I've learned about from anthropologists that primitive societies didn't have division of labor. It's just uh, when they went fishing, the uh, native guy who could fish the best would lead. Then they'd stop fishing, they'd go uh, look for something else, do some other kind of act, uh, hunting or gathering activity, and the person who could do that would lead. Yeah. So they'd rotate leadership, yeah, well, temporary leadership, I, and, I, and I that, your, that's I, the ideal. Bob, I just love your new world anthropological radicalism. This is um, one of the great um, things about the, the new world. Uh, left is is because they have to think like that because they went and smashed up these um, native um, ways of doing things and had to think about them more than we had to do in in the old world and uh, it, one of the electrifying texts I read over the last year was um, and I can never remember his name and he's called I had to look up his name. I always have to look at it. It's the Chicago Surrealist. You're, who is the Chicago Surrealist? Franklin. Franklin Rosamond. And he published a, um, a little article about the writings that Karl Marx made about the Iroquois towards the end of his life. He made notes on how the Iroquois organized their society and what smoking the peace pipe really meant and all the rest of it. And it's... An electric piece of writing by a Chicago Surrealist, which explains, in, in a similar way to your doing, that by studying prim, so-called primitive societies, we can understand what's missing from the way we do everything, and we understand that in social terms, uh, societies that may have not produced surplus value and missiles and things that can shoot at the moon are doing things in ways which we could emulate and we could actually live and we could start changing things by living a bit more like that. No, no, I, do, I don't mean that. You don't mean uh, you're that. Gonna have to, you're going to have to be quiet for a minute. Let me, uh, I just started, and you misinterpreted where I was going and, and said that. It was very informative what you said. I acknowledge it, but let me say this. So if primitive people were like that, 
Uh, it's when they got more sedentary and agricultural that hierarchy and division of labor came in. They weren't as fluid. They weren't nomadic. They weren't just uh, following whoever could do something real good. And, and maybe one guy was really good at something, and then the next day a woman was better, so she'd lead. So it was really, uh, you could say, tactile in the sense it wasn't locked into any, any kind of specialist hierarchy. Okay, it, with agriculture... In terms, you're talking about um, pre-class society, before there is a surplus, produce that society, and certain people are in control of it. And in the Marxist yes, terminology, yes. those people are the priests, they're in charge of the temple with the surplus grain in it, and they start producing all the anti-sexual horseshit that we all have to listen to because they're in charge of the grain and they don't want us to know they're in charge of the grain. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. So then we move into the uh, early writing societies and then the, well, jump ahead, the industrial societies. What's interesting about the electric societies is that it, retrie it retrieves this primitive uh, non-specialism, not immediately, but as time goes on and now we have the internet where kids don't even have to go to school, they can uh, get all kinds of information. Now maybe they need to be taught and that's another question. I can see that we're moving more and more to retrieving uh, people substituting for each other. And the specialist bureaucracy wake, uh, collapse. Even in banking, we are witnessing the present collapse because the specialist hierarchy values of money can't sustain themselves in a virtual economy. And it's and happened we, in medicine, hasn't it, where, I mean, general practitioners in England, the doctor you go to see is called a GP on the NHS, a general practitioner, a doctor you can go to see... And there's been a complete culture change over the last 10 years because they realize that their patients can go and Google any complaint and find out more. And, you know, they've got a little something wrong with their kneecap. And they, they can go and research it. They, they'll know more about kneecaps when they go and see the GP to get a prescription for a drug than the GP knows. And this Perfect spreading, point. Yeah, Perfect. Yeah. The, the information society, and this was McClellan's point, is changing the specialist tendency of industrial societies. And part of the crisis is people don't know how to live non-specialist, so they become um, extremely fundamental, fundamentalist in academic disciplines or in uh, religious disciplines, all kinds of things. They stick, they just stop. And as I can't take this flux. And then we have uh, the, the neoconservative, the neo-reaction to all this. Mm. But this technological evolution is carrying on regardless of whether you can handle it or not. But, Bob, can uh, I throw in my grumpy Marxist critique of all this? So this is true of knowledge, but in terms of money and control of money, I don't see this new democracy happening. Oh, I don't call it democracy. It's not a democracy. I think it's a, it's, it's a violent upsetting of everything. People aren't... That's why I want to go back. Just a side thing. The reason Zappa is saying, if you like in this music, would you stop dancing? Would you listen? I think Zappa was wondering, like McLuhan, this is a powerful force. Can society handle it? And so McLuhan recommended turning off TV for six months collectively so we get a handle on it. Now, we couldn't turn off the internet, but right now someone's trying to stop the internet on a certain level with the collapse of the virtual economy. So the, the juggling, uh, it's not just a utopian uh, all service, you know, all good stuff and uh, that's coming from the digitalized economy. That's the, that was the st stupidity of Wired Magazine and the, all the digerati who were celebrating the new virtual uh, environment as if this was a utopian transformation. It was That was really immature. And the gall of, of yeah, Wired it's, it's Magazine like, to make McClure yeah. and the patron saint and had no clue of his objections to what they were presenting. Yeah, well, it's, and, it's very good to hear you say that because um, um, for my awareness of McClure was so dominated by Wired Magazine to hear a critical you know, way of looking at it explains various things to me and that's really good. Yeah, I'm going to, um, you know, I don't think in this introductory hour we're going to get to it, but I have marked off a whole bunch of stuff from an art class in cleavage. How uh, Trotsky uh, talks like McLuhan, McLuhan talks like Trotsky. McLuhan and Adorno are interchangeable. McLuhan and Ben Watson are. I, I'm going through this whole inventory of quotes, which I will eventually, you know, when we get time, uh, get into that. I want to go into your book. And, well, I'm uh, really I think hoping you I, will because I was thinking that's how we'd start and you'd fire off at me, but I'm quite glad we've done this initial thrashing around because I feel like we've, we've stirred up the water and the bubbles and you know, and, and now we can be prepared for the sharks and the uh, 
everything else and the um, hot air balloons that are going to descend on the surface and save us. And so I feel like I'm more prepared now with this. We've thrashed around in this hour. I haven't got down very much to specifics, but I feel like we're. I'm really looking forward to the next one. Yeah, we're getting somewhere. How much more time we got? Well, we've got another five minutes to chat. You know? Okay, right, because I want to say this. Sort of, um, I'm, 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 I'm focusing on Zappa uh, because of our common interest in him, but the, the uh, relevance of Zappa is becoming stronger. I just listened last night to a CBC documentary. It's up on the website. I'll send it to you. They did uh, two, and, two and three quarter hours on Zappa. And what was great is they did a lot of interviewing with Ruth Underwood. I mean, we're starting to get into what really went on in the Zappa world. And the CBC uh, documentary is really good because they begin by saying that Frank Zappa is probably one of the ter most tremendous composers of the 20th century. Now, you don't hear major media saying that kind of stuff. But I think Zappa is becoming archetypal. and He's becoming beer. He said he never wanted to become a bottle of beer, but he's becoming beer. And uh, so uh, a beer. I mean, I once walked into a pub in Cambridge and they had a beer called Yellow Snow and a little picture of a little Frank Zappa with huskies. And this was a <laughs> um, bitter, you know, peculiar kind of English beer produced um, by a tiny little company with no permission from the Zappa estate or anything. And it was um, beautiful, hoppy, yellow uh, beer. And I drank it with great pleasure. But that's the only beer I know in connection with Frank Zappa. Well, what about when they're talking about Zappa in 200 motels and they start looking at the beer bottle? Do you remember that part? I think the, the Mark and Howard, whatever their names were, uh, uh, were talking. Remember? Well, and they say he's yeah. listening to us now. Yeah. And then they, the camera goes and shows a beer bottle, I think. Yeah. Yeah, well, <laughs> anyways, uh, I always thought that Zappa was making a joke of how his memory would be commodified. But anyways, I'm just pointing out that there's, there's now beginning the archetypal appreciation of Zappa, but at the same time there's rumors that uh, somebody might make a movie about Zappa, you know, in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to begin with that because I want us to, uh, I want people to know what we're thinking about Frank. We're, well, we're, we're presenting, what, what we're I, I, like, about... I like what you did in your book, and our class in Cleavage is a second book on Zappa, nobody knows that, that you did two books on Zappa. And so we work from Zappa up to the present and, you know, mm -hmm. see where he failed, see where, he, where he's useful. And I think we should inform anybody who listens to this um, broadcast that, um, that, that our Zappa is diametrically opposed to any kind of Hollywood Zappa that might arrive. I mean, you always hope, but the idea that Hollywood could deal with Zappa seems to me um, completely monstrous and ridiculous because Frank Zappa worked in Hollywood and everything he did, I mean, he did write um, soundtracks for... for budget B-movie cowboy films when he was coming up. But it seems to me that the whole import of his, his what he did um, cannot be fitted into any um, Hollywood um, view of the world. No, exactly. And, I, and that's why I think there's an urgency and a timeliness of what we're doing. Because as Zappa's reputation, not that he cared, but uh, for us, we're still here. If it, as his, his reputation gets distorted or played with, I want my interpretation of Frank, which no one's ever really heard, uh, I want to hear your interpretation of Frank and how you use him to be made prominent now. Yeah, so it's kind of no we are, the, we are the voices. Um, the, we are the Beavis and Butthead of the, uh, <laughs> of the, the Hollywoodification of Frank Zappa. We're the commentary that needs to be spread all over it and is actually the only thing that will make the film any good. I agree. And, uh, and I want to say, if we're, since we're talking about the word tactile and the phenomenon of tactility, that Esom Plastic... The very concept that Coleridge came up with, to the degree I understand it, it means the tactile. <laughs> Ease and plastic is tactile. Uh, maybe I should explain to listeners that Ease and plastic was a word coined by the romantic poet Samuel Taylor Coleridge, and he thought that the word imagination had been overplayed, so he invented a word and he took Ease and plastic, which is the Greek for whole and shaping and shaping into a whole, and made up the term Ease and plastic. Yes, and tactility is the function in our brains that interplays the sensory data from the particular senses and shapes them, like plastic, like sculpture. And, and as we come to the end of this uh, section, Zappa's always talking about shaping things. 
Shady, he says sometimes always. it's architecture, sometimes yeah. it's sculpture when he talks about his music. And let's yeah. remember that one of his favorite musicians was Buckminster Fuller. That's something I want to explore uh, next time. Okay, Why next is week we'll talk Fuller? about that musician, Buckminster Fuller, although I think he had more to do with domes. No, that and that's your sphere.